Afternoon, everybody. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Katrina. Fiona, Katrina, Kathy. Yeah, hi, Fiona. <gasps> Julian. Julian, uh oh, right. I must change my view to make sure I can see it. <laughs> Isla and Amy and Jane. Okay, Maggie, um, I'll keep an eye in case we have anyone coming along, okay. but we're ready to start. Okay. Thank you. And if you could just um, pull up the slides, that would be great. Kathy, thank you very much. So, welcome everyone um, to our Developing International Collaboration and Partnerships webinar. Um, this is part of our, um, our Creatives Unlimited program. Um, we have three strands to that, growing leaders, growing ambition, and growing visibility. Um, these webinars are designed to, um, to bring a broad range of of, of, of viewpoints to us. Now I'm just going to, I'm Maggie Broadley, Programs Manager, in case anyone doesn't know. And we also have today Tabby, uh, Tabby Medallia, our creative producer. Just a quick um, Zoom housekeeping. Um, we will put you all on mute during our guest speaker's presentation. However, you, you will be given the opportunity at the end of, of Jean's presentation to, to get into conversation with Jean. Um, if you have any questions or any observations, please do throughout the uh, presentation, please do add those in the chat button, which you'll be able to access at the bottom of the screen. And I think that is all we've got in terms of, of housekeeping. We are being recorded. So if anyone would prefer not to be on camera, you can put your camera off and, and just stay in the room, but we'd love to see you, your smiling faces here too. Um, so the, uh, I'm delighted to, um, to, to say that we have been um, funded by Creative Scotland and the Hollywood Trust and also long-term funding from the Fries and Galloway Council. Um, without this funding, we wouldn't be able to, to run our Creatives Unlimited programme. Um, so special thanks to them today. And now I can say again, I am really, we are delighted to introduce um, today's guest speaker, Jean Cameron, who's an inspirational freelance creative producer and facilitator who has displayed a passionate commitment um, to uh, working across the arts and culture. Um, Jean is going to give more of, of an insight into her, her experience and her practice. Um, but I would just like to say that this is about Jean's experience, which is varied and very exciting, actually. But we'll also talk, so Jean will talk about that, but also reference COVID and the changes that that, that has brought, because um, obviously working internationally, there are added issues there. I just want to very quickly say something. I've been a long term admirer of, of Jean and the work that she does. I've known of her for a, a while and actually, you know, met her about three, three and a half years ago and was not disappointed in any way. But just a, she'll tell you about a professional development. I just want to say quickly that uh, Jean's from, from Paisley and her first love was dance and she remembers taking a part in a dance display at the age of three in Paisley Town Hall. Um, Jean also remembers learning Gaelic songs and being aware of a real sense of an indigenous Scottish culture. She remembers dancing, falling in love with classic, classical music um, and a particular piece that stayed with her her whole life and, and remains important to her. Um, I think Jean's quoted as saying, there was never any dumbing down. Um, she remembers Scottish opera coming to school thanks to teachers who valued the arts and the arts were definitely brought into the community. And just last thing, um, Gerard Butler's claim to fame was he actually attended the same school uh -huh. as Jean Cameron. So, <laughs> I, um, <laughs> further, I, I do, I'd like to, to welcome Jean and see we are looking forward to, to our uh, to listening to her experiences now. Okay, thank you. 
I also have two grandchildren in the wings. I'm going to put myself on <laughs> silent so you don't get interrupted. Thank you, Jean. Can I just quickly remind everyone that we are recording this webinar session um, so that anyone who's not able to attend, they can view the video from the DG Unlimited website at a later date. Jean, over to you. Oh, Hello, thank you so much, um, Tabby, and thank you so much, Maggie, for that super uh, warm uh, introduction. I feel me tear in my eye there, uh, be, uh, being reminded of, of my, my paisleyness. And um, good afternoon, everyone. It's really good to be with you today. And it was lovely hearing Maggie talk about the, the three strands to the work in d &G and growing, growing leaders as one of those strands and I've, I've had the pleasure of contributing to the Young Leaders Programme as a, as a mentor since um, September I think, Is that, 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 that's right, um, and I really am I'm impressed by the ambition um, that Dumfries and Galloway through the work that Maggie and Tabby are doing, uh, the, the ambition that, that the area has for its young leaders um, and um, also really excited to the commitment that these online networking opportunities um, of the Creative Unlimited um, webinars offer. So well, well done, D and G. You're doing you're, you're doing good stuff. Um, I, I'm really glad that Maggie um, framed this uh, as a personal account of international working. It it, it really is, and um, I hope by sharing my personal experiences and um, personal stories that um, that that you don't find it completely anecdotal and useless, but you will find some some um, some uh, reflection and processes etc that are that, that um that strike you um for, and remind you of the, the work that you you you're doing internationally and moving forward um there really there really isn't one size fits all approach to international working um and i think that is that that is something that um i want to point out um, at the, the beginning of this. So what am I going to talk to you about today? I'm going to talk quite a bit about the geopolitical um, context that, uh, that have informed the, the, the international cultural projects that I've, that I've worked on. I guess with international projects, um, it's almost like you have to look through the both sides of the telescope simultaneously. So by that, I mean, there's the, you look through the lens of the thing that grabs your attention, grabs your heart, the collaboration, the partnership that you want to make. And at the same, the, the, the same time, that other side of the telescope, that bigger lens of who's looking at, who, who, who's looking at this uh, part of the world um, that can resource your projects um, so that's that you know I think that, that that kind of link to the geopolitical context and funding is really important because international projects need resources and um, I, I hope it helps you to consider um, that every moment's a shifting moment and our place our place in the world is a fluid evolving thing so that does indicate I think in terms of where priorities for resourcing international collaborations might follow. I'm going to draw on a couple of examples from my own experience um, which I hope uh, provide useful insights and highlight a couple of practical resources um, for where, where I keep an eye out for international working opportunities. I'm sure they're already on your radar, but um, just encouraging to, to keep an eye on these things in terms of um, what's coming up that might, pr might provide an opportunity to collaborate in the future with international par partners. And I hope that all of that acts as a springboard for um, uh, exchanging experiences amongst us at the, and, and our, share our own knowledge, all of, all, all of our knowledge um, at the, the chat at the, the, towards the end of this session. So a bit of background, you already know I'm from Paisley. Thank you, Maggie. I've got a Paisley pattern shirt on today. Always, always about the Paisley. Um, and uh, I live at Paisley. Um, the Paisley I grew up in, the Paisley that still exists, is a large, uh, there's, there's a large and 
vibrant Italo-Scotsese, Italian-Scottish community within the town. Um, probably the best known uh, son gives, gives Jerry Butler a run for his money is Paolo Nettini, being one of our best known Italo-Scotsese um, Paisley buddies. As a result of that large uh, Italo-Scotsese community, when I was at school in Paisley, um, I studied French and Italian. Italian was the second language. And um, I, I, I studied them all through, I started when I was 12 uh, and went on to, to do six year studies in both of them. Um, and my first time on a plane was um, just as I was leaving six year at school, um, I grew up in Fergus Lake Park in Paisley. We had a, a community of Salesian sisters and nuns who did amazing outreach work with young people there. And their, um, th their sisters in Italy um, were, were preparing the summer that I left school in Scotland to run courses in teaching English to children because English was going to be made compulsory um, from the autumn term in schools across Italian uh, primary schools. So I, I was very lucky that I, I, I was one of the young women from across um, the UK who had the opportunity to go and teach English in summer schools all across Italy with lots of small incredible Italian children who corrected my Italian every opportunity. I went from I went on uh, very quickly when I came back to Edinburgh to study French and Italian with business studies and re realized super quickly that that was preparing me for working in in corporate organizations like Zanussi or Olivetti and that really wasn't quite me so I came back to the west coast pretty quickly and um went to what was then Jordan Hill, now the University of Strathclyde, to study uh, community arts. And the, 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 this is, I know it's a bit of a backstory, but it's relevant because this was in the heady days of Glasgow 1990, where international working was par for the course. And often international working was really inclusive, making connections between artists and communities. So I remember, you know, the town of Rostov on Don in Russia, one of Glasgow's twin cities, sending a group of young people who were Cossack dancers to meet and perform with Scottish Ballet in 1990. And I think I, I, I also there was a group of residents from Castle Milk uh, working as part of the community arts set project who visited Rostov. Um, in 92, uh, Edinburgh hosted a European summit meeting. Some of you may remember that. And I was lucky enough to combine my language skills and my passion for the arts while working as a festival assistant at Dance Space, which was hosting a European dance festival at the time. And it was a joy. Um, I, I, it was quite an easy gig, if I'm honest about it. All I needed to do was to learn to be able to count up to eight in French and know how to say arms, feet, turn, etc. Because I was translating for a French hip hop dance company doing community classes out in Wester Hales. But this was this was great fun. And, and again, I think that the, the this was the environment that, that, that I started working internationally in um, and, uh, and, and combined for me the two things that I'm passionate from. So it, it was uh, really about international ambition, being outward looking, but opportunity for community participation at, at the, the same time. Um, and I'm really, you, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm of a generation that's taken international connections for granted. And my goodness, isn't it precarious now um, through COVID, which has been mentioned, but also um, the, the, the being on the cusp of exiting um, the, 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 the EU as well. So I think we have a duty to facilitate wherever we can that sense of confidence and curiosity and opportunity um, for our young people in particular to, to make connections. Um, and, and, and I know that, you know, Dumfries and Galloway are really interested in growing leaders. So that's the, that, that international ambition for them and their, their, their international mobility is something I'm sure that will be considered considered after this. Um, Tabby, could I maybe ask you to bring out up the first um, image? There's only two images, people, don't worry. 
So I don't know if you remember, I love Twitter, and um, I don't know if you rem remember around about October this year, there was this tweet trend about how it started, how it's going. Um, and I, I think this probably just sums sums up for me. So that, that, that the, the image on the left hand side of the screen was um, 1991. And I was lucky enough to be funded by the British Council's Youth Exchange program um, to spend a month in Pordenone in, uh, in, in Italy, very near Venice, where that photo was taken, and to connect with um, young people from across the EU who were um, young leaders, I guess, um, studying Italian but working in, in culture. And um, I hope it was like a travel grant that they feel was uh, worthwhile because how it's going now, that, that, that project, um, that, that picture on the right hand side um, is me uh, um, as di creative director of the UK Italy season. This was um, launching the ambitions of the season in the uh, in Villa Volonsky, which is the UK ambassador's residence in Rome last year. Goodness, goodness, whoever knew what was coming next. Thanks, Tabby. That I can, can go back to the. We can come back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so a, a, a little bit about the kind of ask the wider context. What what can create the impetus for international collaborations and create the conditions um, that and the, that support international collaborations? Um, my my work and therefore this my focus through this presentation uh, is tends to be a place based approach to work. So if I look at the projects that I um, have worked on, I was the project director for my hometown of Paisley's bid Paisley 2021. I've been the producer of Glasgow International Festival of Visual Art. I've produced Scotland at Venice. Um, I've just been the, the producer for the UK, the, I've been the creative director for the UK Italy season. So it's something about place-based work that I that's my way of navigating the, the work. And, and, and for me, in terms of offering you a lever for why international working often happens, it's often a response to someone, whether it be a local authority or a, a national government or um, a, an international opportunity thinking, what, what, what does a place want to be known for? What is it we want to be known for? And I think by, it, it, you, you know, it's, 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 it's a simple question. And I think it's deceptively simple because it doesn't, the answer to that, um, what does a place want to be known for? It doesn't, it's not a static question, is it? I mean, it, it, it shifts and places shift and, and reimagine their identity over time. But I, I think often culture can be harnessed as an international calling card on the world stage. And um, by answering that, that, that question of what does a place want to be known for, it really can be an indicator of what priorities and, and by dint of that resources and opportunities might be out there um, on the when you're horizon scanning international collaborations. And it's never too early to horizon scan international collaborations. Um, so although we're, we, we're, we're, we're um, stuck in this horrible pandemic at the moment. You know, I, I really encourage us all to um, horizon scan and think about what, what's coming next. But by answering that question of what, what do we want to be known for, it helps us think about our values. And by thinking about our values, I, I guess where in the world we consider it important to have those international um, connections. And it helps us, um, what we want to be known for is about the stories we want to tell about ourselves um, at any given time. And it does shift as geopolitical context shifts. Um, and that, that can be really challenging to get support if you're an artist or a cultural or, or organization. If your passion, your side of the telescope is um, not seen as a current priority by the, um, the, the decision makers with the, that wider lens of the telescope. Um, but I, I, th I, think it, I think it isn't, you know, just, I was thinking about it 
in terms of uh, this session, even our relationship with the USA and how we think about the USA and what does it want to be known for has shifted enormously, hasn't it? Um, and since 2008, with the election of Obama coming through the Trump presidency and then being on our, the cusp of the Joe Biden, Kamala Harris era. Um, so it, it, I, I think it is really, it, it is interesting to, con to consider. Um, um, and it is an interesting moment for us at the end of 2020, isn't it, to be think thinking about international working within the midst of a global pandemic, major shutdowns, restrictions on international travel, on the brink of a new relationship with EU neighbours um, as the UK exits the European Union. We, in September, I think, the Westminster government merged the UK um, government's Department for International Development and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. That's a real indicator for um, focus, I think, in terms of um, the, the international priorities. But for these reasons, it's the perfect time to be thinking about how we might collaborate um, internationally in the in, in the future and um, totally anything I'm presenting just now is about best guesses amidst, amidst uh, uncertainty but I, I really think we need to think about about potential um there's a British I, I've been working as a freelance creative um, director for British Council and the, there's a really good British Council report which is from 2017 but still relevant called the value of trust and, and I think um, that this report um, indicates the relationship between people's values and their trust in the UK um, and how it affects people's intentions intentions to work with uh, the, the, the four countries of the, the, the UK. And I think that's really important. You know, when you're putting together an international project, um, it's as much about what can you, you know, it's important, what can you do this end to, to garner support and foster a community and resources around your project? But it's also really important about who is invested internationally in working with our place at any given time. And um, the, the, on a positive, the report highlights the values or qualities that are most important in earning trust as being openness, contribution to development in poorer countries, a free justice system, and world class, world leading, sorry, arts and culture. Um, so you, 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 we have the proof, we have the findings that, sh that should give us hope that cultural relations engagement is associated with higher levels of trust in the UK. So um, I think at these really, this crossroads of where we sit in the world, and um, we should find that very, very, um, very, very hopeful. Um, and that report also tells was that 75% of the people surveyed internationally who had participated in a UK cultural relations activity, such as um, that could be a school exchange or uh, an education or volunteer programme, they are um, they're, they're, they're much higher levels of, 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 of trust in, the, in, in working with our country. Um, and I, I think it's, that's important because it, it really demonstrates that culture um, is, is, it has so much power, if you like, and so much traction um, on the international um, on the international stage. And um, you yeah, know, I've talked a lot about the British Council, but I think also we, we're so lucky working in and living in Scotland because we also have a Scottish government that um, that takes international work very, very seriously. And I think again, horizon scanning, our place changing in the world, it's it, it's not lost in any of us that we're less than six months away from a Scottish government election in May 2021. So again, you know, that, that what do we want to be known for? The answer from the Scottish government uh, agenda is, is it, 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 it stands well in itself. It's about international, internationalizing a Scotland that benefits us all. So I think um, I think there, there, there's really there's real 
opportunities, kind of revisiting the Scottish, the Scottish government's existing international framework, but keeping an eye on um, as, as the um, the landscape shifts in terms of manifestos, etc., coming out for the forthcoming election to, um, to, to kind of get a sense of where international opportunities might be. Um, uh, there might be an indication of that within the um, within those within those documents. Um, I guess. The, uh, what the before I go on to, I'm going to go on to a couple of case studies now, but I guess what to kind of say about international collaborations is it doesn't always happen somewhere else. International collaboration, international working happens here. It happens in our places at home in Scotland. And I think that that's so important to remember the amazing international opportunities we have in our own country. Um, and given everything that's happened with COVID, um, I, I haven't been anywhere since January 2020 um, and have been able to deliver 60 events for the British Council without leaving my home. Um, and of course, these were online. So I, I, I just, I, 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 I realise that that's a very long preamble. I'm going to say a little bit um, now about some uh, case studies. So I'm going to try and, I'm going to uh, tell me if you can nod, Tabby, because I know you're on mute. But can you, can you see, I've come off mute. I've can you come see off mute. my poster behind? Can you yes, see? Yes, I can that? see it. Can people. other people see it? Yeah. Yeah. People are nodding. Okay. Yes. So the, this um this usually lives on top of my fridge, but I'm not very good with technology, so I brought it through here, um, rather than sending you a slide. But this that that that's the uh, um an image from the Georgian International Festival of Theatre acronym GIFT, there's a clue there, um, which I was lucky to be the international project coordinator for um, in the mid 90s. It took place in T T Tbilisi. And um, the reason I, I want to mention that project is it was born at the Edinburgh Festival, again, grasping um, grasping the opportunity of any festivals we have across Scotland with the with international in their title is probably a good place to kind of rock up, spend time, meet delegates, sow the seeds for international projects. Um, and the Georgian project, we were, we, we, we were working, we were showing Georgian, Georgian work is incredibly beautiful. They have the most incredible um, tradition of polyphonic singing and very visual, visual beautiful theatre. They also are the oldest wine producers in the world, so that's my kind of country. Um, but we, we were working with them in August 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed and they were performing with us at assembly rooms in Edinburgh. We were showing their Midsummer's Night Dream um, on the stages of the uh, of, um, of the assembly rooms in Edinburgh in 1993 when they went through a civil war and President Shevardnadze, who uh, was the first Georgian president in this young democracy, sent a message to the Western world through a fax machine um, assembly, and which was read out um, in, in the context of an arts festival. And as, and, and as you know, the Edinburgh Festival was set up as a place for healing and, and uh, European connection. Um, almost 75 years ago after the Second World War and our Georgian friends um, took heart from that and in their answer to what do we want to be known for was to set up the Gift Festival um, for the first time opening doors beyond the Soviet Union to arts companies from ac across, across the world to come and present their work. Um, we had we had a lot of uh, visual arts people who were bringing publications and catalogues in for, um, uh, to to Georgia. People hadn't um, had that exposure, if you like, to contemporary practice, and we had a huge range of um, we had a huge range of theatre companies come and perform um, and with with. Uh, under the, the sort of guidance 
of a, a, an international board that again was about my, my Georgian colleague Ketty Dolice being in Edinburgh and thinking Sydney International Theatre here, Perth International Theatre here. Let's get a let's get a, 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 a board of directors from across the world who will bring their work. And um, I, I said to you that the, the project was called the acronym was GIFT. Um, and this was very apt because um, at that point, the, 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 there just wasn't the money for people to pay fees in Georgia, but they wanted to welcome the world to their stages and connect with Georgian audiences. It's the most welcoming country I have ever, ever been to. And um, the artists gifted their services for free. So we also, we were hosted um, hospitality in Georgia is amazing. We were hosted in people's houses and um, the artists gifted their, their work and, and the gift of the Georgian people was, was so much back in return. And those, th those, those friendships have kind of lasted a lifetime. The second, oh, where's my other, my, my, the second other project I want to talk about very briefly. Um, I'm just, can you see that one Tabby? <laughs> my other my next visual link again yeah, a, 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 again born born in edinburgh this this project um, was a project that I was really lucky enough to work with and um, the indigenous contemporary scene, which I developed um, with um, Emily, Emily Monet. She, she, it was her idea, but I, I was the Scottish partner, Emily Monet, who's an indigenous um, theater maker um, who, who lives in Montreal uh, with Canada Hub, who some of you might know is an Edinburgh um, venue. And, and in terms of that answer of what do you want to be known for? Um, I, was I, I was introduced to these uh, colleagues because the work that I'd done in the Commonwealth Games with Caribbean countries, particularly about um, the colonial role of Scotland um, across the empire. And um, I, I was really um, bowled away and, and uh, felt compelled to do something when my Indigenous Canadian colleagues reminded me and, and educated me actually on the, the relationship of the Scots as colonial figures in Canada, um, particularly through the fur trade um, and Johnny MacDonald, who was born in Glasgow and became the first Prime Minister of, of um, Canada. Um, and as someone whose maternal gal grandmother had been a gale and uh, cleared as a, uh, uh, from speaking cleared from her own land and speaking her own language, he um, he set up these in incredible systems that separated indigenous um, native uh, Canadian peoples, the children from their parents, and uh, basically broke down their language systems. So um, I think in terms of, of Scotland at this moment, there's something very powerful happening about our role as colonizers and, um, uh, and um, working hard um, to understand the hurt that we have caused across the world, um, but working with contemporary makers on, on, on really interesting projects about decolonization. Um, and that was a very interesting one, just one of the, the, the by the time that project was alive um, in 2019 last year, I had passed it over to um, colleagues in Edinburgh who could do much more with it than I could because they were big organisations, but um, the Edinburgh International Festival and the Edinburgh International Book Festival, as well as a couple of venues at the Fringe, really ran with the developmental work that we'd done on that. And, but one of the beautiful things I was able to do during again Celtic Connections and International Festival was at the beginning of 2019 to bring um, Gaelic speaking artists together with a, a, a delegation with Indigenous Canadians to work through um, what does ind indigeneity mean in both our places. It was interesting, it's quite different in both places because in Scotland it's so wrapped up in language, um, but in Canada 
language had been eradicated. So again, a real, a, a, a really important exchange. Um, I'm going to kind of move on now and ask to my final example. And it's it's about Italy. It's where I've just been. <laughs> it's where I've come from. And maybe Tabby could ask you to ch share the website. Just maybe we'll we'll just have that up and scroll through the images there, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. You just tell me when you want me to scroll. Just, just well, listen, I don't mind you just slowly scrolling through that just now. Um, but basically, um, while, while Tabby's uh, sc scrolling, the, the I, I on Thursday night last week, we just delivered our final event um, in what has been the, the um, British Council's first ever digitally led season of culture. Um, British Council basically chooses different countries to do a season with every year. Um, I came in to be the creative director of this one um, in February 2019. Um, we had an, uh, uh, we, an open call through the British Council's arts pages for um, expressions of interest in the project. We funded outward delegations. Um, again, it was an open call for those going out to Italy to see work. We had in we had inbound delegations at the Edinburgh Festival last year and at the Great Escape Music Festival in Brighton. And these kind of, again, those that, that delegations, those things that are really important first steps to get to know each other, sort of formed the basis for, for work. My theme, uh, my curatorial theme for the season was being present. Um, and I came up with that in April 2019. Um, really, there was lots of reason about being present. I, I think I'm always interested in who's present, who's absent, how you amplify the voices of those less heard. But I think also there was something there about British Council being present in Italy for um, more than 70 years. It set up just after the Second World War, so way before the EU and absolutely the appetite for the, of the British Council and our partners in both Italy and the UK to be present in each other's work um, way beyond whatever happens uh, as we exit um, the EU and to develop these future relationships. We had a beautiful programme of work um, geared up at the end of 2019. I think my programme got signed off in December 2019. And then, of course, we know what happened next. Um, and one of the things that I guess is, is not transparent, but it is, it is public knowledge, and I feel I can share it with you, is that the British Council, it operates in 110 countries. And how it's funded to work across different parts of the world is different. So again, it can be can be tricky navigating. So you, you know, jumping back to early in the presentation, um, the, the the part the Department of International Development being merged with the FCO. You know, there's there, 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 there's a, an impetus for a certain resource perhaps for work to be done in um, overseas development countries for British Council, but maybe less so in countries such as Canada that we've just been discussing, or certainly the EU. Um, but one of the things that, one of the ways that British Council does income generate is by teaching English. And we were, um, yeah, Tabby, you can go onto that next page if you like. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, and what, what happened very quickly when coronavirus hit um, China was the British Council had to shut down um, a, a huge number of its English language schools in China, Latin America, the EU, and its test centres. So it, it kind of authenticates English tests around the world. It lost millions and millions of pounds in the first two months of this year. Um, and it basically put a freeze on its activity for a period of time um, uh, during 2020. But there was such a strength of feeling that because of Italy and Bergamo being this ground zero, if you like, in terms of um, coronavirus hitting Europe, that, that we wanted, if we couldn't stand 
um, face to face with our colleagues in Italy, that we wanted to show that we were standing shoulder to shoulder with them. So um, we were, we thank goodness, and the, the, the UK ambassador, Jill Morris in Italy was a real champion for this. We, we, we kept going and we committed to delivering a, a season of culture. And Tabby, bless her, is, is scrolling brilliantly through the, uh, the, the links there. And I'm sure we can, we can post these links actually to you. But I think, well, you know, in terms of that, the programme that, 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 that Tabby's got up just now, I'm ju just, just to, to um, flag up a couple of things that we really might illustrate how we've been working differently in this digital age. Um, the, the, there was the Shakespeare, which I think is the first, maybe one of the first projects there. We did a, the, the forced entertainment, so an amazing experimental um, UK company reimagined the, the complete work of Shakespeare to be performed using household utensils at their kitchen tables. Um, and this was like proper Zoom theatre and really relatable too, in terms of the, the, the scalability of the work. But um, what was quite incredible there was Roma Europa, our partners in Italy, as well as seven other international festivals that knew uh, forced entertainment's work. They all put commissioning money um, we were able to support that, but the, the, they all put commissioning money into this or into this um, theatre company to say, look, expand your practice, adapt to working on the small screen, and um, we will take the conventions of co-producing work amongst a number of international partners, and rather than you getting on a plane to tour it, um, we will all put a virtual curtain up on our own festival's websites and present it that way. So that was pretty amazing. Um, the, one of the other projects to highlight there is the Glasgow Turin Twin City partnership, which um, again was, was a, a lesson in humility and, and being humble. I think we, we worked with um, OGR, which was a, an amazing massive space in Turin that was built originally to build locomotive trains and Glasgow's tramway, a tram dep depot, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, share, share a, a heritage, I guess, of why they were first there, but they've got a really close programming aesthetic now, which was a natural fit. But we had to be very, um, we, 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 we traveled in faith with this project because the OGR um, was converted into a COVID hospital. And um, it's quite something because of the, the uh, working with colleagues who are seeing that happen to their venue and have no no sense of whether they're going to open up as an art space again. Um, and I, I, th I think that that um, that too speeds things of how everything was happening at a different speed in Italy from what was here and then Italy emerging before we were over the summer, although we're both in a very similar place now in times of lockdown. For me, that was um, the, the lessons in terms of international working to take away from that are we, we have to move forward positively, optimistically, but with an awful lot of kindness because um, things are so uncertain and what we're feeling here isn't necessarily the same place emotionally that our international partners are. But I think if you have that kindness and that agility um, and, and scenario plan, um, then an awful lot can be delivered on online. And, and just to close, um, and I'm sorry that was a whirlwind, but just to close, I'm going to ask Tabby to bring up my last slide because it's got some of my favourite people people in it and it's um goodness knows we didn't when this is this is a photo that was taken in Rome on St Andrew's Day <laughs> last year um and I just uh, in a way that that all, all threads all roads you know lead to Rome and all threads lead back to Paisley for me so there's me wearing my Paisley path my Paisley tartan 
next to the Honorary Consul for Italy in Glasgow, who is a fellow Paisley buddy of mine, Ronnie Confrey, um, right in the middle. Um, there's international working at its just its best, both inward and outward, with the wonderful Richard DeMarco, who was guest of honour, with our um, ambassador, Jill Morris, who's an amazing woman who gets the arts um, and culture, and Caterina, who is the mayor of Barga in Italy, where a lot of our italo scotsese uh, community hail from. So, you, you, you know, that, that, that the, we're, we've got so much to build on as Scots in terms of what do we want to be known for, what we are known for um, across the world. And I think for me that there's a continuum and a thread in that photo that makes me feel really positive. And that's where I'd like to um, leave it and say thank you to you for listening and maybe ask Tabby to open us up to discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Jean. Yes, let's have a chat. <laughs> because you've just given us so much food for thought and, so and some interesting things. I have no doubt that we've all got some questions. So um, feel free to unmute yourself. And does anyone have anything that they would like to ask Jean? Kathy? Yeah, um, Jean, thanks for that, that was great. Um, tell me, how do you see your next year shaping up? Given that you've done 60 events from home, What's the way yeah. forward for you? I'm so glad you asked that question because um, the, uh, the, I, I genuinely don't know on one level because I, I finished my contract with British Council on the 10th of December, but I have a, str I have a strong feeling that the, the next international opportunity is Glasgow hosting COP. Mm. You know, it's, it's a bit like the Commonwealth Games. There wasn't a blueprint about how you did culture in relation to that. And Glasgow made it its own and it's a world event. It's, it's dealing with one of the major issues of our time. Who knows whether it'll be in person or online. It, it, you know, it brings in those, those notions of indigeneity. If we look at the global south and we look at the world's forest, we look at the stewardship there, it's an indigenous people. So I kind of feel it's caught. I don't know, but that's my hunch. Jean, just for people who don't know, what's COP? COP26 is, um, it's the big, it's a worldwide um, uh, environmental gathering. COP stands for Conference of the Parties. That doesn't give you a clue, does it? The, 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 there was Paris, I think, was maybe the last one, COP25 in Kyoto, etc. It should have happened this year. Um, and interestingly, it's a UK project with Italy. So it was in my reckoning for, um, for this year, the Youth Cop is being held in Milan um, and would have been part of our season if it had gone ahead face to face. But everything um, has been moved to Glasgow hosting this international um, event where some really big targets on climate have to be signed and agreed to. Um, it, it will happen, I think, the 1st to the 12th of November next year. Thank, thank you, Jean. It's just I'm mindful that people will be watching this after this, and so they might be interested to have a little bit more detail. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Oh. Hi, Fiona. Um, I can unmute you there if you click that now. Hi um, Fiona. Hello, hello. Um, I was just wondering where do we start if we are very small and we're wanting to make um, approach um, other organisations also small but looking for cultural exchange either of artists or events um, being very localised here in Douglas and Galloway. Where would yeah. we start? Would it be the British Council? Well, the two places, and I'm sorry, I, I've, I've got a tend to rabbit, so I'm sorry I've gone on quite a bit, but the two resources I was definitely going to mention are the British Council Arts Newsletter, and it's, it's uh, produced to, uh, every two weeks. You can sign up for that online. But the other place, which I think is great, and I was really encouraged looking at it today because it had lots on it, 
is the um, Creative Scotland's News and Opportunities site. Mm -hmm. So as you, you probably are all tuned in to get your email on a Friday, but I looked on the, uh, I filtered by international earlier today. There's a lot there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'll do that. Anyone else? Amy says, thank you so much. Thank you, Amy, for joining us. She has to leave. I have a question. Just, oh, Julian, Julian's got a question. Hi, Julian. Um, there you go. Um, I, I was wondering uh, whether there are strands on, uh, God, I'm gonna find this difficult to describe, particular uh, particular cultural strands, let's say, oh, I don't know, I'm going to pick it out of the hat, uh, medieval history that applies right the way across Europe, but are there particular, or medieval art, are there particular uh, ways of digging into that um, um, so that you can um, see what's going on uh, internationally rather than um, just, just in this yeah. local scholarly sense? Yep. I'm only giving so, that as an example. Oh, it's a, well, well um, it's a good, it's a great example. And I would say that's where I would be looking up UNESCO, World Cities. Yeah. Um, and, you, you, you know, looking at UNESCO's programmes that they run, it's also a good, um, it, 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 it's also good to see what opportunities they've got coming up. But th those world, th those world, UNESCO cities, heritage projects are good, but also thinking about um, uh, the Museums Association. The UK's Museums Association is fabulous and very internationally connected and works with lots of um, uh, members across the UK who are very specific specific and, and, and small, um, uh, you know, we've got to remember St. Fagan's in, 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 in in Wales winning the Museum of the Year. So um, I think it's about having the story we want to tell. But I think the Museums Association might be an interesting place to look at that too. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Hi, Patricia. Oh, hi there. Thanks hi. very much for such an interesting talk. I was just thinking, um, because um, I'm thinking of doing a project in collaboration with a number of people who uh, work in Spain. And I was thinking about identifying funding streams and really for somebody who hasn't got those streams online and is an individual and in, in light of maybe the lack or reduction of linkages that are now available through our European associations, through those systems, let's put it that way. Um, whether there's a case for maybe Creative Scotland or an arts body um, to, you know, be the hub of resources. Because it seems to me that culture is going to have to make its own connections. Mm. And um, that that might be a priority of the Scottish Government, either through Creative Scotland or in a different way. And particularly for people who live in Dumfries and Galloway, who aren't in the central belt, who are on the periphery of mm. those systems right now anyway, um, that there might be a case um, for, for that kind of thing. And, um, you know, obviously you're in, uh, can, uh, contact with so many bodies. Do you know? Do you know whether that's likely to happen in in the absence of cultural systems being made available because of Brexit? Um, I wish I was able to come onto this call with more certainty. It is such a live situation politically in terms of the negotiations that I think all the systems are looking at seeing what how these negotiations. Um, what happens, how they conclude, what can, I, I, I mean, I, I think international projects are expensive. They really, they are, and they don't, you know, it might, they, they, they don't always 
come with pots of money. I mean, you you do them because you want to do them. Like the Georgian example of gifting your service or the the Canadians when they were doing their research stayed stayed with me because we'd no funding initially, you know, and the, we're, that, that, that was a little bit um, about it. What, do, what can I say usefully? Kate Deans. Kate Deans is still in post. She's got, a, I think, um, she, she's got a Creative Scotland email address. She is Creative Europe Desk Scotland. One person, Creative Europe Desk Scotland. She's housed within Creative Scotland. And as much as the, 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 the UK government have um, removed us from being lead partners for... Um, any Creative Europe funding. I've, I, I think people are still able to work with, um, like as, as a third party country with, I mean, most of those projects are triangular anyway, um, uh, the, the, if your applicant is in um, Spain, then you, the, there's still a way of being associated. Those, those projects are, um, sometimes are very big, but I think the Creative Europe Desk um, for the last two years in particular that I've been aware of have made more fleet of foot um, monies available, smaller scale amounts of money, kind of more manageable to get your head around in terms of um, going for them as a smaller organisation or as an independent. Kate is certainly someone worth speaking to i mean the other the, the other thing when we when we talked about trust um earlier in the presentation is, is the the twinning networks you know um is, is, is there anything there in terms of uh do you know in, in terms of certain i'm lucky i'm in glasgow it's got very it's got seven twins cities across the world but um, there's something about that commitment to active twinning um look glasgow's glasgow's one of the cities next year and i know i'm going on about glasgow a lot but you know for the commonwealth games it was again it was it, it, thanks to creative scotland it was it, it was scott there was a scotland wide program but we have got I know these are not the most obvious things but we've got euro 2020 the football championships Glasgow is one of the hosts for that. I suspect there will be a cultural programme relating to that in the summer. But we're not, you, you, you know, it's like that being present theme. There's a big appetite and we know that. You know, you, 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 I'm thinking of certain sports, Spain, Scottish government have done some really brilliant work with Galicia. Um, they they were a kind of host, a featured country, let's say, at Celtic Connections, maybe it was 2018. So, you know, what do we want to be known for? Certain parts of states, Spain have that, that autonomous mindset that actually there's, 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 that is, that works well sometimes with where we are sitting with. Thanks, thanks very much. Does anybody else have a question or have a comment? I've got a very quick question, Jean, if that's all right, because you've said it a few times, what do we want to be known for? How do you handle looking at us from, from the international perspective? We have a very different idea of what we want to be known for, depending on whether we're Dumfries and Galloway or Scotland or the United Kingdom. And then in my experience with film people, particularly in Europe and in America, they don't really see regions. They see particular projects or they see Scotland or they see the United Kingdom. And I just wondered how you have managed to navigate that. And then very quickly, the other question is, where would be the best place to source metrics and statistical data that proves international collaboration is good because increasingly the funders need us to prove that this is going to be a good idea. Um, I'm, hmm. I'm developing a Creative Scotland bid right now and there's potential there for collaboration, but we need to prove to them why we don't actually just want to go a jolly to America, you know? Yep. And it's not very easy to go on a jolly to, to America, is it, right now? So no. I'm going to start with the second question first. You, at the moment, 
And, and forgive me if this has shifted, but at the moment, I think international is one of Creative Scotland's five cross-cutting themes. So mm -hmm. I don't yeah. think you have to go much further than Creative Scotland's own website to, to look at um, that. You, you Again, when I was speaking about um, the British Council working in different ways in different parts of the world, that's that makes sense to me. It would be horrible if it had a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, we have Nora Campbell, as our British Council Scotland Arts Officer, working in Edinburgh, Arts Manager, I beg your pardon, working in Edinburgh, known as a fantastic and very generous person to, uh, to, to, to get to know. Um, and that's different from the, but I work with British Council Italy. That's the team I work with, but there is a British Council Scotland team. Um, the, 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 the report I mentioned, which is uh, <laughs> head of research, British Council's based in mm -hmm. Edinburgh, who knew, Christine, um, but the, the report I re re mentioned is the, the value of trust, I think it's called that, it's a 2017 report, which demonstrates culture as a, an indicator for, for, for um, places mm -hmm. trusting our country. Um, in terms of that navigation of mm, nav navigation uh, 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 of, of wh what your calling card is, I mean, that's really what you're asking, isn't it? Um, it, it it's, it's, oh, I don't know. I, I think, I mean, I can't, uh, I do, I, I flit about between my <laughs> local, I mean, Hey, I've got a Paisley Parton shirt on. Paisley. There's a people know Paisley Parton. It gives me a starter for ten for my story or whiskey. You know, people love Scotland. I know that. And please, I'm not trying to. Whiskey's an important, you, you, you know, um, export for for us. People love Scotland. I found it hard. Um, I found it hard to um, persuade my partners in Italy originally to think about getting to know a UK beyond the big names they knew in London. Yeah, that's it's, why I'm asking you. It's the case, you know, they all wanted to work with the Tate. Well, we all want to work with the Tate, but we, we, went on a, we went on a journey. And I think that is, you know, so it is, it's like any communication. It's like, it's a dialogue. Does, does that make sense? So it's, I, I think that agility, agility and a lot of letting go that we've had to do during COVID has prepared us to just be more adaptable. Um, I, I, I think, and I don't think that's a bad thing. So, um, I, you, you know, those Italian partners went on a journey and they got fantastic um, uh, projects. And a lot of them with next generation artists that I think they will be very proud to say we were there first. We gave them their first international opportunity. But it's the, I don't, yeah, I, I think it's the, the dialogue thing. Hmm. Thank you, Jean. I, I bet you someone else up here has got a better answer to that. <laughs> well, I do, if anyone wants to contribute, Maggie, or. Yeah, I, it's just I kind of, there's a thing about patience as well and that don't you know these because because i'm sitting here wearing this scarf which is one of the outcomes of an international collaboration i was involved with started off and again it's about other organizations a creative scotland craft curators tour to australia during um the, the you know the australia being early there that was 2013 develop and it's not just about the relationships you develop whilst you're out there it's then the colleagues that you go with the relationships you develop through that we eventually brought an Australian artist who connected with a core group of us brought her to Scotland and eventually and I was involved in a project I was an executive director for a project I moved on from that but in 2018 then we finally got to the end and there was a wonderful exhibition with an Australian artist who used local collections in four different areas of Scotland. So it's that relationships, uh, you know, I like the way you pulled that, you know, there are a lot of the stats here, the international work, relationships with your colleagues, 
and the long end game. Don't be put off by five years. Other interesting, really wonderful things happened with different partners during that period. But um, I wanted to wear this today to remind me of, you know, the long game um, and also why I wanted Jean and Tabby as well. To, you know, we wanted Jean to come and talk to us today. So if, if everyone kind of has, you know, you know had their questions, the opportunity to give that. I'd just like to thank everyone for coming today. Um, thank my wonderful colleague, Tabby, um, for, for what she's done today and in the lead up to this, and just for being a great colleague. And finally, Jean, um, um, Bella, Bella, just wonderful. Um, and uh, it's given us all a, a lot of insight and you're very generous with some of your connections and knowledge as well, which is much appreciated. I would just like to remind everyone that will be a little feedback form coming out after this. Please do um, complete it. We want to know what you think. We want to have any ideas that you might have for um, future webinar webinars ideas. Um, and so, just Can I just give a wee plug for the um, next webinar, which yes. will be Good on the 30th day. of yes. November. It's going to be a panel discussion. We're going to be talking about our aspirations and hopes for arts and creativity post-COVID. The panel are Gillian Eason from Creative Dundee, Nick Halfhide, who is the Executive Director of South of Scotland Enterprise, and the president of the Dumfries and Galloway branch of the Small Business Federation, Paul O'Keefe, who's also a trustee of Campbell Line. So that's shaping up to be a really interesting panel discussion. It'd be lovely if you are able to join that. Thanks, folks. OK, so uh, good afternoon and have a good rest of, of the day, folks, and look forward to seeing you, hopefully, some of you next next. Thanks, Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Jean. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Bye. Travel well. Bye.